Oh my God, guys. Lead co-host here, AV to the seventh power. Hope you guys are doing well, man. Listen, who'd you think was going to be in the building? Who did you think was going to be here? Come on. We have to do something a little special, you know, from time to time. Did you? Who did you think was taking over? Did you think it was going to be lead after weeks? He's still on vacation. He's still on vacation. Or he could be tied up somewhere. We're just going to get some estrogen in the building. This is what a smooth cat that's 5'3 looks like in this chair. Going to go ahead and uh, bring some femininity into place. You know what I mean? Look at this. I'm going to play around for you guys. Got some Tom Ford, Oud Wood, look, you know, a little bottom of the bottle. Bottom of the bottle action. Listen, like, listen, this is our playground tonight. We got the pesos going on, got this bread going. Like, this is gonna be so much oh fun. Oh my god, guys. I'm so excited to be here. How I'm are you guys always doing? wondering what this studio How looks are you like. guys doing? That that was back in the day. It's not today, it's not today, but I needed to throw you off a little bit and apologize for being a little late. Hi, everybody. What did you just watch? That was AV a year ago here in Atlanta, in Lead Studio. We threw you guys off for a minute. That was fun, okay? I also wanted to acknowledge the people that are like, Avi, your soundboard really sucks. I hate that buzzer sound. I hate, oh, let's turn it down. I hate that that is the correct. I hate that it's the, the clue, the plot thickens. I hate your sounds. But at one point, I was behind that soundboard, and it was absolute amaze balls. I hope you guys are having a great Thursday. Welcome. We have a lot to cover today, but I did want to apologize. And that was my fun way of apologizing for you or to you for being late. One thing that I will do is after this stream ends, of course, we will stamp it up with timestamps, but I will also include a link to that particular stream Last year, Lead and I had a fun idea where I would just start the stream from his studio, from his stream with me there. It was fantastic. It was a lot of fun. And it followed a meetup that we had had in San Diego where we got a chance to meet so many of you guys in person. And it was it was amazing. So if you haven't seen that stream and if you're new to us and didn't even know it existed, um, I will link that card for your viewing pleasure. I know you'll love it. Oh my God. Today, I had to, I have a full page of notes. Where do we start? What's the agenda look like? Of course, we're going to have this fun intro. Content. The Department of Justice has been, has been looking into Fannie Willis. I want you to know that it's a Biden run DOJ. So we'll talk about that. That's the big highlight of this. We're also going to talk a little bit about Harrison Floyd, because I want to catch you up on Harrison Floyd. He's one of the defendants in the Georgia election case against Donald Trump. He made some allegations last week that I thought were interesting, and I know you will too, right? So we're going to talk about that. Boots. Been checking out Boots' Twitter account um, last week. There was a motion to dismiss the entire case on the First Amendment that Lee and I covered together. We did that, I think it was like two weeks ago now. The judge responded last Friday and denied that motion to dismiss. So we have a comment, a public comment from Boots to review with you guys. But also, Fanny had a response document to the appeal this week. So we're also going to look at that. But honestly, guys, there's so much to talk about. Did you hear about OJ? Do you hear about OJ? Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. OJ Simpson, if you haven't heard already and you've been living under a rock, has passed this morning um, due to cancer. And, you know, we all know OJ in the legal space. Everybody looks at the OJ trial and they talk about the glove not fitting. If the glove doesn't fit, then you must a quit. I mean, I have a red glove here. It's trending on Twitter right now. <laughs> Ironically, you know what else it's trending with? Aaron Hernandez. I'm from Boston. So this is crazy to me that Aaron Hernandez is also trending at the same time as this case. It's like, really? 
I'm not going to get into it. You guys can look at why it's trending. Click on the trending hashtag and you will see why it's trending. Um, but it's a little crazy. It is a little crazy to say the very least. On the aspect of OJ, and this is just a little bit of humor and fun. Again, you people that are like, just get to the point. I'm going to have fun for five minutes with my folks. Okay? Just bear with me. Just bear with me. They waited for a long time. I was late. Got to give them some heat. The first thing we need to talk about, OJ, I don't know if you guys have heard of the podcast that um, that Cameron and Mace have. Apparently, before OJ passed, they had OJ on as a guest on their podcast, and he said something abundantly funny um, that I think that we can look at in the spirit of fun in the legal space. I'm going to go to channel announcements and then we're going to, we're going to dive into the fanny stuff. But literally I saw this about an hour ago. This is part of the reason why I was late guys. I was laughing at this for like 20 minutes, 20 minutes straight with the freak off nails and all. Okay. Um, let me go to this and then I'm going to come to you guys in the chat to see who's here. But Again, OJ has passed today, and as an homage, homage to OJ, we're going to look at one of, his, one of his very last podcast appearances on the It Is What It Is podcast hosted by Cameron and one Mace. Okay, here it is. Let's watch together. Jack said men shouldn't open up to women because they'll use it against them. He said whenever something go down, they're going to throw it back in your face. Do y'all agree? OJ first. OJ first. Uh, <laughs> when you say open up to women, I don't know what he's talking about. Emotional. Is he talking about confessing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, man. Don't, don't confess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I think you're right. Don't say nothing. It was your, it was, it was your lying eyes. <laughs> so leave me out of the confession. Yeah. Leave him out of the confession. Oh, no confession. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Y'all got to leave me out of this. All these episodes. <laughs> Yeah, I could that. not, you guys. <laughs> this is OJ saying this. This is why these guys are crying, laughing, no confessing, <laughs> red-handed. If the glove doesn't fit, oh, look at OJ. Goodness. Yeah, oh, kill a birthday. This is classic. Look at the one. Look at the one. Yeah. Oh, my God. Guys, I'm sorry. I laughed. This is why I was late. I laughed for a half hour because after he said that, I'm going to bring it back. Look at him with the white shirt. I want you to pay attention to the very bottom of your right hand screen. Okay. OJ said that. Like, don't confess to women. Look at it. Look at it. Look at this. <laughs> oh, kill a birthday. This is classic. There's one in the interview. Yeah. yeah. Oh, blue, I'm sweating off that. Wine, yeah. The blueberry juice to kick that. Oh, shit. Oh, oh shit. Oh. Don't tell a nun. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. Look, man. So, <laughs> without going too further into it, guys, that is... That is one of our last memory of O.J. Simpson. Of course, he was an American football player that did his thing for a long time, but is famous for his involvement in one of America's largest murder cases um, that was televised across the world. It's one of the first ones. Um, Rob Kardashian, I believe, was his friend and attorney at the time. Johnny Cochran was involved in that case. It is literally one of the landmark things. So, you know, this is not intended to start the stream by bashing OJ Simpson. It is just like, did you really just say that months before you passed away and then had some wine and just sipped it? So I, I, I apologize for being late, guys. That, that is what I laughed at for a little while. Let me see who we have in the building and then we will jump right into this. Um, 
shenanigans, guys. And also, this was a, initially supposed to be a Diddy stream at 12 p.m. Eastern. We had to switch it to this fanny thing. So much is coming out. And the DOJ stuff, I mean, the DOJ stuff just kind of thickens the plot. Shout out to Outchair Gaiman. We love you, AV. I love you, too. Shout out to Nurse Janice, who's in the building. Shout out to EC. Shout out to Ken, who says, always good to meet new folks. Hi, Ken. Shout out to the Brandon Lesko, who says, why, God? Why? <laughs> it's good to see you, Lesko. Shout out to E. Capone, who says, I bet Fanny and Nathan wish they never met. I mean, that's the thing. Yesterday, the lead attorney and I had an opportunity to talk with an attorney that is closely involved in the divorce matter for Nathan Wade and one Joycelyn Wade. Now, um, her name is Andy. She was amazing to talk to. She was so much fun. Great attorney. Also has a YouTube channel. But she was able to give us some insight into the divorce matter regarding Nathan Wade and Joycelyn Wade. Nathan Wade, you guys have to keep in mind, is a attorney. Not only is he an attorney, he's also a former judge and resigned from his position as a special prosecutor in this case in Fulton County on March 15th, which is not a long time ago. It's about two to three weeks ago. Since I'm talking about cards, I will also link to that. Uh, so if you're watching this on replay, you'll have the links to the things that I'm referring to. But we did that interview yesterday and it was fantastic. But the thing that um, Andy, Andre Andrea, um, Joycelyn Wade's attorney had shed light on was just some of the control, some of the uh, motions practice, so many motions to delay that divorce from happening was kind of um, slowed down at the hand of Nathan himself. And we learned that we thought that Terrence Bradley was his attorney representing him. Terrence Bradley was not the only person, not the only lawyer that was close to the Nathan Wade law firm. He had two partners. I don't, I think it was Bradley Campbell and Wade. Um, that like, he was not the only attorney that was involved with that. There was a second attorney from the same law firm that took over after Terrence. So if we're talking about the odor, the odor of mendacity, I mean, the plot thickens, guys. The plot thickens. So when we heard Andy say that, it raised a lot of questions. She said she like shed a lot of light. Another misconception out there in the public was that uh, Joycelyn Wade was always living in Texas, not always living in Texas. Let me be careful with my words here. She was living in, te in Texas at the time of the divorce and at the time that she was served. Do you know that Nathan Wade got this job with Fanny on November 1st of 2021 or 22? Don't quote me on that right now. But on November 1st, the next day he files for divorce. The second thing that he did he changed the locks and Joycelyn could not get in into their marital home after he filed for divorce. The big thing, though, is that she was living in that home the entire time. We did not know that. The court of public perception is watching the shit show in Fulton County unfold in February and March. And we're learning about all of this stuff. And we're like, what the hell is going on? What is happening here? You've got a DA and a special prosecutor prosecuting Trump in a relationship, but he's also filing for divorce the day after he gets the job. So check out that interview, guys. Like we had a fantastic time talking to Andy yesterday. And if you haven't seen it, I mean, it just really, really gives you some context into what's happening here. So thank you, E. Capone, for being here. Hi, EC. Hi, Kent. I think I said hi to Kent. Captain Teach. Captain Teach says, AV, my love, it is good to see you. Uh, every, everybody's like, why are you late? I told you. I, I hope that was worth it. I hope the OJ thing was worth it. But I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Yes, I was coming from the Pantene factory. Notice the curls. Notice the curls. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Uh, They're like, is she coming back from Fogo? Justice is looking sloppy. Shout out to the big white horse. 
I am fashionably late, scrolling, scrolling past the late stuff. Okay, you guys saw it. You saw, you saw, you know, you saw the opening. I'm glad you like it. It looks like you guys, you laughed at that. Yeah, that's it. The bottom of the bottle, bottom of the fifth. <laughs> I had fun doing that episode. Honestly, guys, like that was the one of the funnest things Lead and I pulled off. I'm gonna go to some supers real quick and we'll jump right into content. Shout out to Amber Reed. Sends $10.99 or $9.99 and says, do your thing, AV. Thank you so much, Amber. Really appreciate that. Shout out to Mr. Told You, who says, just contributing to the live. It was either lead or you. So this is easy. Ooh. <laughs> Don't let him see you say that. And then again, shout out to Brandon Lesko, who says, soundboard upgrade fun. You know, it's not I'm going to give you a cash app sound for that. Here's the thing. It's not that bad. I just need to refresh it. Like, here's the thing. There's eight buttons. You know, here's the Rodecaster Pro, Pro thing. I've had this for a year. I just need to find new sounds that you guys like. So if you want that lead alarm thing, I can get it. If you want some, if you want his voice on my thing, we could do that too. But, um, what I'll do is a poll after this, maybe towards the end of the stream. I will pull you guys to see what sounds you want. In fact, I had someone email me last week about this sound. People hate it. I don't, I mean, they hate that that was wrong. It's not, I mean, I have it on the lowest setting right now, but if it's really like bothering your ears, like we will get new sounds, guys. We will do this. It's going to happen. Okay, channel announcements. Let's get into today's content. Brandon Lesko, I'm so happy to see you over here on my side today. All right, channel announcements. Personally, I have made a big decision. Many of you have been like, AV, what is wrong with you? Take the bar exam. I finished law, law school and I wanted to take my time because I was working full time. All of you guys were like, take the bar exam immediately. I'm taking the bar exam. All right, I'm, go I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. You guys push me to do it. I will keep you updated as we go. I've decided to do it. And like, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. So those of you that have been like, oh my God, please take the bar exam. I'm gonna do it. All right, fine, you win. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna take it this year. Um, but one thing that has led me to mention that is, you know, I don't know if you guys saw the lead attorney's community post yesterday, he's going to be taking some time off. Um, the reason why I am able to take the bar exam uninterrupted is because I'm a proud student of his courses that have enabled me to do YouTube full time, leave corporate America, focus strictly on the bar exam and do this show with you guys every day. If you have not taken that course yet and have thought about becoming a content creator, now is your time to do it. I think he has the code FANNY still available. We'll get a link for you guys, or maybe you'll have an AV7 code that you can use. But um, yeah, I'm doing this YouTube thing full, like full time, full throttle, everything legal, every single day. You guys will find me here. If it's not every single day, because you know people need time off too. Um, I will be here, but I just wanted to let you guys know where we're going. Let you guys know what the future looks like for this particular channel, but also just co-sign the fact that um, I've co-hosted with Lee for two years. I've learned everything that I could about live streaming from him. And um, I don't think there's a bigger advocate for his courses than me. Like, look at this. Like, you have proof right here. It works. It works. Live streaming works. I'm able to focus on a goal that I've been trying to get done forever because of YouTube uninterrupted. Because like when we're corporate slaves or you have like a big job and you're trying to like go to law school on the side is the worst thing ever. But like to try to pass the bar exam on the first try when you have a full time job, everyone else has eight hours in a day to study. But like you, if you're working full time, will have like two or four. It's just not going to work. So I just wanted to say that, like, I'm, I'm so pumped to be able to take this journey this year and I'm going to take you guys with me, you know? So shout out to OJ, shout out to Lee, shout out to the bar exam. One last thing. 
men and women, mostly men, Mother's Day is coming. You all have moms. If they're here, great. If, if they have passed, rest in peace. But you all have women in your lives, right? I have partnered with Chalkboard Candle on this fanny thing. They have made a candle for me, um, for AV, and it says that was cute. <laughs> Just because we've been covering this case. There's a discount code. I think it's in the description right now. These candles, we're going to light one right now because there's a lot we need to talk about. That was cute, right? Um, I have it in the scent of pipe tobacco. You can get any scent on their website. These guys are amazing. Here's why. Every purchase that you make goes back to American teachers. Like giving back to our students, giving back to kids. Every time you buy something on that site, like they're giving back to teachers. I could not say no to these guys. American-based small mom and pop shop company in Minnesota. I like to give back to small businesses. Um, when they reached out to me with this idea, I thought it was amazing. It's on their website right now. Using my code, you get 15% site-wide off. But you can get that that was cute candle in any scent you want. So please check out Chalkboard Candle. They're an awesome company. Um, but I, I wanted to get these things out of the way because I'm giving people shout outs. But man, oh man, I was really excited to work with these guys. And it's not like a cheap glass. This is ceramic. And it's nice. You know, it looks a luxury. You know, it's a ceramic thing. Although it says that was cute, you know, because we think about Fanny when we talk about that. Um, it's just a, it's a great cause. Like when I spend money, I like it to go to a good cause. I hope you guys do too. If you're interested, there's more information in the description box. Shout out to Chalkboard Candle. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, are you guys ready for this? Let's get into content. If you've been following the Fannie Willis thing here in Georgia, we know that it has been a ride. We've been watching the court proceedings. There's a lot of corruption that's happening but one of the related topics is Jim Jordan wanting to speak to Fannie Willis in Congress regarding the way that federal money was spent. It was delegated to the um, Bolton County District Attorney's Office by the Department of Justice, and Congress has oversight of how money is spent. So they can inquire if they want to look at how money is spent, right? Jim Jordan sends Fannie Willis's office a letter and says, hey, we gave you these grants, these federal grants over the last couple of years. I think it was four years altogether. Although you have supplied us with information, we have concerns. Why? We have one young lady that worked for your office, the whistleblower, who had mentioned to you that she thought that these funds were inappropriately spent by one of the people that you appointed to use the money. Allegedly, they used the money on swag, on travel, and other things when it should have been going back to the community for community-based initiatives. That whistleblower was fired. So Congress hears about this, Jim Jordan and the people on... Um, that panel that need to review this, both Democrat and uh, Republican, the oversight committee needed to have an understanding of how that money was spent, why it was spent in the way that it was spent. And let's just look at it. Fanny, let's just look at it. For the four years, we want five categories of documents. Any records that are related to how you record keep, any records related to the system that is record keeping for you, any records related to when that money came in and how it was spent when it went out, all of those things. There's two other ones that I'm not going to go into, but there were five categories. I showed you guys the letter, I think it was two streams ago, where Fanny, of course, of course, defiantly responded to Jim Jordan and said, hey, I'm prosecuting President Trump over here. I don't have time for this. We're going to give it you, we're going to give you some of the documents on a rolling basis. You want them all now. 
You want to place me in contempt by March 28th. It is past, I believe, it's past March 28th, guys. Today is April 11th. Congress did not put her in contempt. Congress did not receive those documents. But at the same time, here's the thing, and you guys know I have a um, public relations background. When you start to defy things, like, yeah, maybe Congress cannot hold you accountable immediately. But if the, if the government body that is inquiring on this is involved, especially the Department of Justice. I want you guys to keep in mind, it's a Biden Department of Justice. They are coming for Fannie. And they discover that there were inconsistencies, inconsistencies and in what she was saying and how they are record keeping. All of those things inconsistencies. So we're going to look at that right now. This one comes from the Newsweek and it says Fannie Willis's inconsistencies discovered by the Department of Justice. What do they say? This came out yesterday morning. And they say, hey, Fannie, let's look at this. The Department of Justice is looking at you. But guys, remember what I just mentioned. It is a Biden. It is a Biden Department of Justice. That doesn't mean that it is incredibly non-impartial. I just want you to know what leadership it's under in an election year. It reads, the Department of Justice discovered alleged inconsistencies in Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis's use of some federal grant money according to a new report. That already is alarming. So that means, okay, the contempt thing that Congress tried to get her on, it's fine because there's still options here. DOJ still has to look at it because DOJ, you guys gave her the money. Congress is in the middle because they're in charge of looking at spending power. But that money was still tra you know, trans referred to her by the DOJ. So they have to look into it as well. What this is telling you is that they are performing their own investigation into this. It also goes on to read that Willis has risen to national prominence for leading the Georgia election interference investigation against Donald Trump. Her probe focused on his call to the Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, in which he urged him to find enough votes to tilt the election in his favor. Now, it's wonderful that the only word here that has quotations is find enough votes. This is why, like, sometimes we talk about how media can be biased. And as a person that worked for one of the nation's top four banks for the CEO and talked to reporters all of the time about this type of stuff. When it came to quotes for the phone call, that's not the full context of what he said. But if you notice, the only word that is in quotation marks is find. Pay attention to that. Okay. Continuing on, as well as the alleged plot to submit a false slate of pro Trump electors to the Electoral College. Trump pleaded not guilty to all charges and has accused Willis of targeting him for political purposes. Since the investigation, her conduct has faced heightened scrutiny from conservative critics, including congressional Republicans who have raised questions about her use of federal funds. Again, just being fair here, I do think the way that this is written is a little biased because that's not true. <laughs> Democrats and independents and people from other parties have also criticized her behavior during the course of um, the questioning and the proceedings in the last two months. In February, Fani got on the stand and had some behavior that wasn't okay. 
in January, she got in front of a bunch of people in a pulpit at a church and talked about this case. Two weeks ago at an Easter egg hunt, she was the judge advised, he did not demand, he advised her to not talk about the case. What did she do? She talked about the case. She went to a women's history event at the end of March, talked about the case again. I believe there's another one last week, another women's event. In the last three weeks, after being advised by a judge, three times she has talked about this case. But for um, the way that this is written to say that her conduct has faced scrutiny just from one party, I believe is not necessarily the fairest way to write this out because you can go to CNN. I've seen it. You can go to MSNBC. You can go to some media outlets. I think that there is a consensus among the American public that her conduct is not okay. The way that that was, those hearings were conducted were not okay. The judge himself in the document said, uh, you're wilding out a little bit over here. He did. Maybe not in those words, but um, I think that we can all agree that the conduct is not just based off of one political party and what they are saying, right? So I don't like the way that this was written. No good, Newsweek, no good. Let's keep going. The Department of Justice in a statement first reported by the Washington Free Bacon that um, Beacon, some inconsistencies have been found in her use of the funds. Here's a quote. During our review of the, war, the award to respond to this inquiry, we've noticed some inconsistencies, what Fulton County has reported ooh, to the federal sub-award reporting system. So this is this, the software that they use. And we are working with them to update their reporting accordingly. Let's break that quote down a little bit, because what are they saying here? The Department of Justice has just admitted, and if that's a quote, and this is a spokeswoman from, um, from the Department of Justice, she is admitting, and this is what Jim Jordan and team were looking for, she is admitting that on upon their review, they found some inconsistencies from what the Fulton County District Attorney's Office reported, what they said they spent the money on versus what they were able to find. What this quote says is, forget that we found it. We're going to give them an opportunity to correct it. Dear viewer, I think if we made mistakes like that in our jobs that um, we would be fired. Given the opportunity to make a correction, can you guys put a one in the chat? If you, in your job, if you made a mistake like that, if the federal government in whatever country you work in gave you and your company and whatever job you're in, if they gave you money to spend, and if you incorrectly reported how you spent it, Put a one in the chat if you still think you would have a job. Put a dos, put a two in the chat if you think you would not have a job. So this is why I wanted to start this with the context of you have to look at it like it looks like they're giving her a chance. Jim Jordan extended the deadline to give her to give her and her team the opportunity to bring us these documents so we can see what's happening with these with the whistleblower. What is going on? They were able to give this woman a chance. I don't understand. I mean, I don't know about you guys. I'm scrolling down to the bottom. That's how far behind in the chat I am in. Um Look at that. Look at the twos. Thank you, twos. Thank you, twos. Dear World Question, I got your email and your DM. I have to hit you back. I haven't had a chance to yet. Twos, look at the twos. 10 plus says two, two fired. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I see a single one. I don't think I see a single one in your job if the federal government gave you money. And this is the best part. Do you think they would give you a chance 
to fix it. If we, sorry, I'm going to swear. Sorry for the people that hate it. If we give you a chance to, like, if you fuck up your taxes, the, the IRS will be on top of you. On top. You're not going nowhere. Like, on top. Like, just hovering. Just hovering over your body. You're thinking about it at night. You want to go to sleep. And then you wake up. And, and the federal government's there. Like, they will not do that. So we could do that to regular American citizens. But at the same time, if a like if the DOJ is giving a um, you know prosecutor's office some money, we're going to give them a chance to make a correction. <laughs> ten, shout out to Ten Plus who says a chance to go to jail. Sorry for those the cheap seats in the back, but like they would be hovering over you. You're not allowed to make these mistakes. So going back to this, the fact that we are giving them an opportunity to update their reporting is a little crazy to me. It's a little crazy to me. And you can tell the bias in the way that this is written because it says a spokeswoman told the conservative publication. Can we just write in a way that's fair and not take sides? Come on. Specific details about what inconsistencies were found what the specific grant was intended for or what the funds may have been used for remain unconfirmed. I know you guys were thinking it because I was thinking it too. Oh, there's inconsistencies. This is written by a pro, it seems like not a very fair publication. There were inconsistencies. Okay. Um, what inconsistencies? Which ones? Can we know? What inconsistencies? You're saying that there were inconsistencies, but at the same time, you're also saying that you're going to give them a chance to correct them, and the public does not know what those inconsistencies are. Do you know how we would have known? If she gave the damn documents to Jim Jordan. We would have known. The public would have known. We don't know right now. So I'm like, Newsweek, what is going on? What are we doing over here? Is this how we're reporting the people? And, and this is my favorite part. This is how it ends. It says, Newsweek reached out to Willis's office and the DOJ for comment via, via email. Willis has previously sparred with Jim Jordan, who he's the Ohio Republican who chairs the House Judiciary Committee and her office's use of the grant funds. In February, Jordan and his judiciary, judiciary Committee used a subpoena to Willis's office requesting documents relating to her office's receipt and use of the funds. So I told you guys that. Threatening to hold her in contempt of Congress if she did not provide further documents by March 28th. In her own letter, she responded that her office had already provided you with substantial information about our programs that are funded via federal grants. Notice that she did not say all. She said substantial information. I gave you enough, Jim. You have enough. This is Fanny. Further, as I expressed to you in my letter dated February 13th, 2024, this office is in the process of producing relevant documents to you on a rolling basis. Rolling. And is undertaking a good faith approach to provide you with responsive information about our federal grant funding. Okay. Her office also wrote that Jordan's request of extensive documents demands is unreasonable and uncustomary and would require this government office to divert resources, resources from our primary purpose of prosecuting crime. This is the bombshell. She added that Jordan's efforts will not derail Trump's election interference trial. Fanny, all we want, we have a whistleblower that got walked out of your office. She's 4'11". She's not a threat. The day she got fired, you had 
armed security walk her out of your office because she questioned how this money was used. Congress just wants to see the documents. Documents are provided. Not, not all, some. Some documents are provided. Fanny says, oh, we've given you some. But you know what you're not going to do? You're not going to take the foot off of the gas when it comes to prosecuting Donald Trump on the Fulton County election interference case. Why was that even in there? Fanny, it's relevant in some context, but why is it that relevant? We are talking to you about something else that is completely different. <laughs> And they didn't put her in contempt. And this is what I don't like about news sometimes. Looking at this article, number one, we are talking about a person that has completely violated what Congress asked them to do. They didn't do it. She's admitting that she didn't do it. She's saying we've done partial things. We've given you a substantial amount. She has not used the word all. As a person myself that has contributed into writing things on behalf of a national bank, on the, on behalf of what a CEO says in front of Congress. Like we like to use totality type of verbs when it comes to describing our efforts into doing things. Hey, OCC, here's what we've done. Hey, FDIC, here's what we've done. Hey, Congress, I know you're like, oh, bank, you fucked a lot of people over a few years ago. And we're like, but here's what we've done in totality to make change. Here's what we've done right now. And here's what we're going to continue to do. But are we going to say, you will not take us off of the path of charging people overdraft fees? No. It's, it's out of context. You don't need to say that. So when she's like, you will not take the foot off the gas with charging President Trump. Fanny, what, what are you talking about? It gets really, the way she writes legally sometimes is so, it's going to sound bad. It can be, it seems like it comes from a personal place. I don't want to use the word emotional because we're all human sent, sentient beings. We all have emotions. But I think sometimes like if the point is on one subject, we need to keep it on that one subject. If the subject is give us the documents, and if you can't tell us why, which is what she did, but keep it on the documents. For you to say the efforts will not derail Trump's election interference trial, why did you even need to put that in there? Do you guys remember? And we bought this up yesterday when Lee and I were talking to Joyce and Wade's attorney. Do you remember the emergency motion in this divorce that has nothing to do, like the whole, the whole Fannie Willis getting disqualified from the case, that's a whole different legal matter. The fact that Andy and team sent Fannie Willis a document and it said, hey, we want to subpoena you to be um, a witness or to be deposed or give us information as far as this divorce trial, this divorce case. Do you know Fanny did the same damn thing in that document? They're like, hey, can you make it? Can you come to this hearing? Can you give us information? Here's what we're looking for. In that same damn document, Fanny says, you know, I can't make it because I'm prosecuting the president in this election case. But the worst part, the, the, the problem I had with that document was the part where she said, and you need to talk to Joycelyn, Woy, jo Joycelyn Wade because she had an adulterous affair with someone else in the past and that's why their marriage is irretrievably broken. Why in seven hells is that in that document? That's not what you were asked to do. That's not what you were asked to provide. So in the last two months of us covering this case as a legal scholar, guys, I'm just struggling with the writing that this woman has sometimes. You're including information because you're trying to deflect. Like, don't look at what I'm doing because I'm doing something important. Okay, fine. Go do that. But to like 
to include information that's not relevant to the subject matter is it's not it's not okay. Yeah, not seven hells. For what? I don't know why she writes like this. I don't. And that was a letter to Congress. She doesn't care though. And we know that. We know she doesn't care. Oh. Okay, and, and here's the best part about this article. At the end, it has a fairness meter. How fair was this article? Can I vote right now? <laughs> what do you want me to do? I'm reading it from a communication standpoint. 13 years experience doing this for corporations. That was not, that was not a, that was not okay. Okay. So that's the first thing. We know the DOJ is looking, but the Biden DOJ is not telling us what inconsistencies there were. Pay attention to that. Okay. Today, we have another article. Guess what it says? What other news came in today on Fannie? Former employee is giving Republicans information. So, I love, let's look at this title. Her former employee, indicating one, is giving Republicans information. If it is a committee, if it's a Senate committee comprised of the other side of the aisle, Newsweek, I don't know, Newsweek. It's not, you want a meter? You want your meter? I don't know, Newsweek. It's a little crazy, but let's go in. It says, a former employee of Fulton County DA, Fannie Willis, is reportedly giving information to Republicans amid their probe into how federal funds were used by her office. On Thursday, today, Jim Jordan was on Fox Business this morning, and he was there to talk about a report from the Washington Free Beacon about an investigation into how Willis used federal funds, following information provided by a whistleblower. Jim, and you know what, I might pull this up, guys. He says, Jim says, God bless the whistleblower who came forward. We've talked with this, whistle this whistleblower. She's giving information to the press, to us, and now the DOJ is looking into this. All kinds of problems with Fannie Willis in this ridiculous investigation she's run on President Trump and others. Here's a picture of her. They give us the context. I want to pull it, but it also says the presumptive Republican nominee, Trump, has been accused of conspiring to overturn the 2020 election win in Georgia. Trump has pled not guilty to all charges and repeatedly said the case is politically motivated. Um, while you've indicated the initial documents may be forthcoming, this is what Jim said to Fannie in response to the committee subpoena. The committee has yet to receive any additional responsive materials in the three weeks since your initial response. That's what Jim Jordan said to her in his last letter. Like, hey, we haven't gotten anything from you. And three weeks. And, you know, accordingly, the committee expects that you will produce all responsive documents to the subpoena in, cate in categories prioritized by the committee no later than 12 p.m. noon, March 12, 2024. If you fail to do so, the committee will consider taking further actions such as the contempt of congressional proceedings. Last month, Willis sent Jordan, Jordan a letter saying, as you note in your letter, we've already given you substantial, here it is again, substantial information about our programs. Willis stated that she would be providing information on a rolling basis and criticized Jordan's demands saying they are unreasonable and uncustomary and would require this government office to divert resources from our primary purpose of prosecuting crime. Fulton County District Attorney also noted her letter that Jordan's subpoena would not stop the investigation into Trump. 
This is almost identical. Almost. It gives me vibes of the previous article we just read. No? Does it not? I think three or four of those paragraphs were lifted and shifted from yesterday's article and they put this out today. Come on, Newsweek. Come on, Newsweek. What are we doing, Newsweek? Yes, this is me criticizing you. In a statement to the Washington Free Beacon this week, a spokesperson, this is here too. We just read this. We have noticed some inconsistencies in what Fulton County has reported to the federal subaward reporting system, and we are working with them to update their reporting accordingly. I, we just talked about that, guys. Newsweek literally used four paragraphs. Quatro. Four paragraphs from yesterday. This is why I need my own news network. This is such bullshit. What, how, why do people get paid to recycle things? What's next? Willis was recently ordered to remove Nathan Wade from the case after a motion to disqualify her over the relationship the two had. The case against Trump in Fulton County is expected to proceed in the coming months. Fairness meter. Can, I'm just going to click yes. You cannot make this up. When I, I had to shift topics like two hours ago, guys, and pull all this stuff for you and actually go and do the legal research and grab the documents. I did not think that two separate articles would read identical because people are, shout out to Nurse Janice, that lazy. <laughs> Nurse Janice, do people work hard anymore? Yes, Boston strong. I'm, I'm going back home. I can't wait. Uh, let's go back to some supers and take a quick break from that so I can decompress. Because I, I mean, just as a, as a person that has been in comms, a literary professional, especially in the public, that's so lazy. Don't do that. Don't take an article and slap some words on it, make it super left-leaning and like not be fair in reporting. It's so messed up. <laughs> it really is. All right. I think I left off here. Shout out to Audrey, who says, always a pleasure to hear your content. Audrey, thank you so much. I've been thinking about you a lot. Um, Audrey supports me when I'm on lead side, but she almost every single time I hit this live button and turn the camera on, like I said, guys, I'm, I'm really focusing on the bar exam this year and growing this channel this year. That's it no distractions, maniacally focused on this. Audrey's like one of those people that cheer me on during the process. And it makes me realize like, I think I'm on the right path. I think I'm doing the right thing here. And I want to thank you for that, Audrey, seriously. And, you know, again, these small things add up. It doesn't matter what you send us guys, like whether it's a dollar, four or five dollars, does not matter. The fact that you send anything at all, when we're like working on these goals, it just really helps. So Audrey, thank you for all the cash apps you've sent me this week and also just here on the channel as well. Shout out to Sherry D in the Euros. She sends 20 Euros and says, my first live with AV to the seventh power. So glad to be in the place. Sherry, welcome. And so many of you guys are finding me for the first time. If you're here for the first time, sound off in the comments. Let me know. I, I always read these things afterward um, as we chop up the timestamps and, and put the links in for you guys on all the things that we talked about. I always really enjoy leaving the live chat. So Sherry, I'm so happy that you were able to make it six hours ahead across the pond. I hope you had a good day over there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Let's go, Seth. We lost our white man to, to life in jail. Looking for more hope here. Also check pre-stream donos. Think there was a bill in there you missed. Really? Okay, I will check. I will check. Thank you so much, Brandon. You are the best. I think you are right because when I did pop in there earlier, there was somebody that dropped something, but I will go back to that. Whoever you are, know that I love you and know that Brandon loves you because he's making sure 
that you're getting credit for that. I will go and check that out. Thank you so much, Brandon. Shout out to Ron, who says, AB, future DA of Fulton County. I mean, don't know if I'm, if I'm going to hang out here with all the debauchery that's going on. Um, but I appreciate it, Ron. I hope you're doing well. It's accounting season. Tax day is on Monday. I'm sure you're busy this weekend. I know you are. Shout out to Phil Thomas. Thank you, Phil, who sends $19.99. No comment, no question, pure love of the game. Phil, thank you. I don't think I've seen your name on my side before, so it's really nice to see a ton of new people over here. Super, super nice of you, Phil. Thank you so much. Shout out to Dinara, who says AV7 ace the bar. That's the plan. That is the plan, girl. That is what I'm planning to do. Um, Ron Alexander said, candle of the evening. That was cute. Again, reminder, guys, chalkboard candle. If you're looking for gifts for moms and your family. I'm hooking you up with 15% off. Their candles are awesome. Um, I'm like sending this to family and friends. Grab that candle if you can. All the information you need is in the description box below. So thank you, Ron, for that reminder. Shout out to Raymond, who says, your white daddy here. <laughs> Take the test but only for yourself. That, yes, I did it. The bar thing, you already have more ethics than you will gain with the bar. Thank you so much for saying that, Raymond. White daddy. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I really want to do this as a personal goal for myself, guys. Um, you know, I went to law school and, you know, college late, late bloomer. I think I started college at 24. I was taking classes at night, graduated for, from Purdue, they had a, a online program. I got my bachelor's in legal studies while I was working full time and then went to law school after work, bought a house when I was 29. Like I'm a go getter. I love to roll my sleeves up and focus on something. You know, last year I risked a lot uh, to come down to Atlanta for some things that just didn't pan out. Um, like I can tell you, I sold my house, um, you know walked away from like a job that was like paying like 200K a year. Last year was a million dollar year, you know? Um, so this year I really wanted to find a goal to maniacally focus on and just stay there, stay on that square and not leave until it is complete. So, you know, it's not only for myself. I've always wanted to be a lawyer. I think I'm kind of leaning more towards wills and estates and, and helping people make decisions for their families and their legacies. Um, but I thought a lot about this in the past few days. And I'm like, you know what? Everybody keeps telling me to do it. It's time, you know? So I'm going to bring it over the goal line, Daddy Ray. I'm going to bring it over the goal line. <laughs> Shout out to Dear Woke Christian, who says, read Fanny and Nate's letters back and forth. It's like ChatGPT was writing a rom-com script. Are there letters? Oh, are we talking about the resignation letters? Like, oh my God, you you know, you're leaving because you need to protect me. But thank you for all you did. Thank you for bending. I'm not gonna say it sounds better when Leed says it. Thank you for the fax machine action. Thank you, dear world question. Shout out to Mr. Told You, who says, I bet the investigation is conducted by the DOJ Office, Office of Inspector General, OIG, who investigates federal grant fraud and reports to Condra, Congress, not the AG or the executive branch. Mm, Mr. Told You, the plot thickens. I like that. I think that's probably most likely what is happening because there's a lot of reporting that's happening here, right? who is looking at the oversight of how we, this money is spent. And if both of these entities are investigating it, of course, Congress is going to have their investigation. But you bet your ass that the DOJ, if they're being alleged of giving people money freely, they're not going to want that out there. You can't just give money freely because it's going to make the DOJ look bad if there's no oversight on their end. That's a huge risk. And like it also like shows that you guys are not really, do you have compliance controls in place? When you give people money, like what do you do? So you also have to look at the perception of how things are with both of these entities. Because it's really three. It's like Congress, like, hey, man, what happened to this money? Because we have oversight over federal grants. But DOJ, uh, like if, if this is what's happening, if this is what this whistleblower is saying, you guys need to conduct your own investigation. So Mr. Told you, great comment. Really like that one. Thank you so much. Shout out to Hill Films, who says, good luck on the bar, AV, fellow Boston grad student. Oh, my God. 
right. Awesome, Till. And um, HV brother here. So I know the struggle. Good luck. Thank you, Till. Uh, you know, again, I like Georgia because it's warm down here. I don't want to go back to Boston because it's cold. But if I go back to cold Boston with a goal, I will do it. So thank you so much, Till. And I wonder what your grad program is. It sounds interesting. Let us know. Um, shout out to Karen. Karen says, great live, AV. I cannot wait to see how all this plays out. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Karen. It's very sweet of you. Uh, Domino's, Domino that dude says, not with you on this one, AV7. Jim Jordan's sole purpose is to run interference for Trump. He has no leverage, though. Congress is a toothless tiger. Go Fanny. Go Fanny. Got the candle. Okay. Well, Domino got the candle. Nice. Thank you so much, Domino. Here's the other thing, guys. You don't always have to agree with me. You don't always have to do that. I know that in the past, Jim Jordan has had some Republican values out there. I get it. Congress is related as a toothless tiger. I get it. But for the sole purpose, I don't think that that's his sole purpose here. I do think that there is, especially from what I just mentioned with DOJ. I think the DOJ has a responsibility. If they're going to give federal prosecutors, whether they're in California, whether they're in Massachusetts, if they're in Montana, Idaho, whatever state it is, I think that there needs to be proper oversight. And I hope that's what these entities are trying to accomplish. So thank you for that one, Domino. Nurse Janice says, you're an inspiration. Keep doing this, AV7. I will. I will. I won't give up. I won't give up. I promise you guys. And you guys are so sweet. I mentioned on lead side last week, I had a bad day because nobody was like looking at my, my content. And I don't know what the algorithm just did not push it out that day. And I was like, God damn it. What am I doing this for? You know, like, hmm. But anywho, um, the love I got on lead side that day was amazing, inspirational, and you guys continue to show it over here. So thank you so much, Nurse Janice. I really appreciate you. And then lastly, um, and we'll go back to content, Ricky. Ricky says, hey, AV, 2024 is your year. Great content as always. Thank you so much, Ricky. Thank you guys for all of those supers. We will continue, I believe. I believe Sherry might be the stream sponsor. It's a tie between Sherry and Phil. But there is one that I missed. So I'm not going to dub a stream sponsor just yet. But um, let's get into the comments. And again, reminder, guys, check out Chalkboard Candles. You're buying something for a cause. Okay, going back here. So we know what's happening with the DOJ. We know what's happening with this case. The other thing, and now enters one, Harrison Floyd. Who is Harrison Floyd? Harrison Floyd is one of the defendants in the case and here in Fulton County in Atlanta. Um, he is a black man who actually did time on this case, is represented by an amazing attorney, and has also had an opportunity to dig into this case a little bit more. I did see him on Professor Nez's platform about a week ago, and he did an interview. And there were some concerns. We're going to actually look at, we're going to listen to the recording. He is saying that Fannie Willis has had some biases in this case. He does not feel comfortable with her like prosecuting this case, her office prosecuting this case has been involved in a lot of the motions to get her off of this case. And the big thing with it that we need to focus on is this. He had access to a, a recording in Maryland where Fonnie Willis was having a conversation with someone else and said something, you know, a little bit legally unjust or inappropriate. And what happened is, you guys know in every state, every jurisdiction has specific laws when it comes to recording conversations. Now, in this day and age, you guys are watching me. Many of you guys are in different states. I'm sitting in Georgia right now. Do me a favor, chat. Type in what state you are watching from, just so you guys can see how the level of communication with telecoms, phones, 
you know, texting, emails, all of that. So you can see the level of how far we go. I see the great state of Texas. I see Arizona. I see Texas again. A lot of you guys from Texas, Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Georgia, California. Look at that. 600 people in here. Please, please hit the like button if you can. 600 people in here. Indiana, Arkansas. Look at that. So many of you guys. Lady dies in Virginia, you know, Montana, Minnesota. There's there's so many. You guys see that at this time, communications can go far and wide. I wanted to show you that because your state has a different law when it comes to recording than my state might have. Maryland is one of those states. So if I'm a lawyer and I call a lawyer in another state, we have to talk about consent and you have to let people know when a phone call is being recorded. Harrison Ford's contention is that a phone call happened between Fonnie Willis and another person who resided in Maryland. That phone call was recorded without that person's consent and she needed to know that as a federal prosecutor. Because he was a defendant in this Georgia election case, worked, I believe, on the Trump administration. The issue with him is like he's like, I don't even feel comfortable with her prosecuting this if she if she should know that and does things like this. Is it unrelated? And can you get disqualified? Last week he he did um, a few media interviews and he gave Fani the deadline of Monday to leave this particular case, or he was going to file federal charges. What I'd love to do, um, I'm going to find it so we can watch it together. We're going to watch Harrison's like media statement on that Monday deadline. Obviously that Monday deadline has passed, but after that Monday deadline, do you know what came out? Fonny's response to the defendants trying to take her off the case in the appeals court. I don't understand. I don't understand why it's like the, 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 the it, that's the thing. It's the level of defiance, you know, like she's like, oh, Harrison, you want to give me deadlines? <laughs> you want to give me deadlines? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I really can't. And. Oh, my goodness, like she it's just the way that the timing is done. And I will say, like. You know, the office of Fannie Willis, like they're super calculated. I know that they use software to look at media. Like it, there's no, like, let me go get it. I'm going to get it. Hold on one second. There's no coincidence. There's no coincidence that when Lead and I were covering this, we dropped merch. I dropped merch. It said this. It says that was cute. 2024. You see it? That was cute. Do you know Fannie Willis has merch now that dropped two weeks ago? <laughs> the level of defiance. The level of defiance is crazy here, guys. That That's kind of what I don't like about this sometimes. Like, and she's, she has the opportunity to defend herself all the time, but nobody is, nobody's coming at her for that at all. But it's just, you can just see that there's always like a tit for tat. One party does something that she has to jump in and do. I could not believe that she had merch. I think I saw it on like Phil Holloway's thing. You know, like Phil Holloway's Twitter. He had mentioned it. He's just like, hey, like, did you guys know that she has merch now? I wonder where that came from. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder where it came from. I mean, we're going to monetize what we can, right? Because this case has been crazy and it's been fun for a lot of us to just look at the debauchery, but also enlightening for us to see how national media is talking about this, how national media is taking this, how national media is spinning the narrative sometimes where, you know, what Lead and I love to do is we love to pull the court documents and show you guys them straight up on both sides. And we go from there. Um, here it is. So let's look at Harrison. 
we're going to see his statement from last week. We know that she did not meet the deadline, but I did think that this was interesting because right after that, immediately after that, we got her response to the Trump defendants trying to get her off in the court of appeals, get her off of the case, her off is off of the case. So here's Harrison. Let's see what he has to say. Over to him. Last week, my attorney. Last week, my attorney and I made it public that District Attorney Willis very likely violated the Maryland Wiretapping Act, which is a felony here in Maryland. As far as we are aware, DA Willis did not have a warrant and the call was not made in furtherance of law enforcement because I was already in custody. She simply broke the law. The truth is DA Willis did not like the public backlash she was receiving and over the course of multiple calls, she tried to find a way out of the mess that she created. She also made the claim that I denied a consent bond, which is a lie. The truth is simple and quite frankly sad. DA Willis is blinded by her upbringing, which was deeply rooted in radical progressive ideology and racism. She has no problem weaponizing her skin or her office to further its aims. While my skin is also black, DA Willis identifies me as white and views me as wow. a defender of white supremacists due to my political beliefs. Deep down, she wants to make me pay for what she feels is a betrayal to black culture. Her words and actions consistently demonstrate a hate for white people and a need to make this case about race. She has disrespected Judge McAfee and defense attorneys because of their color of their skin. It's racist and it's wrong. After my attorneys finish working on the appeal Judge McAfee granted, we will bring a motion asking the court to exercise its judicial power on equal protection grounds. Because racism in any form is wrong. I, along with a lot of you, would like a speedy resolution. However, this is more than likely going to take time due to the district attorney's unprofessional, overly aggressive, and untruthful nature. This is, let me be clear that this is not an effort to delay justice or attack the district attorney because of her race or sex. It's because she actually broke the law in the same manner she's falsely accusing me. Thank you, and I will see you back in Georgia. There it is, guys. That's Harrison. That's Harrison's thing that came out last week. I wanted to watch because there was a lot of claims of racism on both sides, and I see some of you guys are like, oh, well, isn't what you're saying kind of racist too, Harrison? Like, what's going on? So I wanted to watch this one play out. I did... I did not watch it, but I did see that Professor Nez had him on his channel last week. So if you guys are interested in the full discussion, I would highly recommend that you check it out there. Um, but it's been interesting, you know, it's been interesting to say the very least for Harrison to come out with these claims. It's just like, okay, I, what I would have loved to see is Harrison come out with these claims, but more along the lines of like how he was fairly impacted in this particular case. Um, you know, that has been yet to be seen. We will go from there. But just know that this was like a big piece of news last week and early this week. Ironically, though, um, Fannie Willis and team, when it came to the appeal, they were like, listen, Trump and them want me off of this case. I am going to file this after what Harrison is saying. I just want to make sure I have the right document up here. Guys, I think this is it. We're going to look at it. We are going to look at it. Certificate. I'm just looking at the dates to make sure it's right. Yes, I have the right document. Perfect. So Harrison gave her this deadline, noon, this past Monday. Get off the case because you might have fairly impacted me as one of the 19 defendants there's some racism happening here. We have the big Bethel church speech. You know, you're talking about race, you're talking about gender, and it shouldn't be about that. If I did something wrong, and here's the thing, Harrison's one of the only people that actually did time. He was incarcerated in jail for this particular case. One of the only ones. 
So I do want to say that. I do want to say that. But of course, we know Fannie Willis is not, and the office is not going to take threats lightly. Boots and team, Ashley, Pantene, all these people wanted to get her kicked off and her office kicked off of the case. Judge McAfee's like, Nathan, you have to go. Judge McAfee had Nathan resign. We're not even had ordered Fannie to make a decision. You, Fannie, and your whole office go and come off of this case or, or Nathan comes off of this case. But there's an odor of mendacity. There is, it's smoky in this room. There's a lot of things that were done. I'm going to make some recommendations to you that you're going to ignore. But a ton of people are watching this nationwide and globally. Half of you guys are in the, some of you guys are in the UK watching this. I'm like, wow. So what are you going to do, Fanny? We saw a letter come from Nathan Wade the same day resigning. End of day. Fanny accepting his resignation. Thank you for the great work that you do. The media is attacking you. But we're going to keep continuing on in the spirit of justice. Her office stayed on. Fanny has not made any court appearances for any of the motions that have been argued. She did make one. Let me say that. She did make one court appearance. I think it was like two weeks ago to support other prosecutors. But the people that are arguing right now cleared them out. Even Adam. Adam Abate, I think, is still on this. but. That's the post-it kid. Shout out to post-its, right? Um, it's just interesting. But let's look at this because we know that the divorce is happening and Nathan Wade and his divorce, even though he was paid like seven fifty, dollars working on this case with Fannie, who's paid all this money, um, is running out. And that's what we talked about yesterday, Lee and I with Joyce and Wade's attorney. He's clearly running out of bread. Anywho, let's look at this. This is the document that was filed after this noon deadline. I think it was in the works before. So let me let me say that it was probably being worked on before. But this is to the Court of Appeals. OK, Fannie's team, the state of Georgia. Look at all the defendants. Trump, Giuliani, Meadows, Clark, Chile, Roman, Schaefer, Lloyd. Latham, these are the defendants that bought forth a motion to the Court of Appeals. Judge McAfee allowed them to do this, was free and accepted the fact that they were going to file the Court of Appeals or an appeal to the Court of Appeals, stating that the decision to keep Fannie and team on this case does not make sense. And they told us why. We reviewed it. Hot off the press. I think I did it two streams ago. This, what we are looking at, is Fannie's response this past Monday. So I'm going to put myself in the corner here, and we are going to analyze this document. So, state of Georgia, they're responding. There she is, the Honorable Fannie T. Willis, Office of the District Attorney. Here she goes. Intro, the applicants seek a review of the Superior Court's order on the motions to dismiss the indictment in this case and to disqualify the district attorney. The trial court held an evidentiary hearing on the motion, which spent, spanned several days of testimony and evidence. Ultimately, the trial court found the evidence is insufficient to establish any actual conflict of interest and decline to dismiss the indictment. That's already something. That's how they're leading this. They're leading with saying, hey, we had an evidentiary hearing for them to prove that I should be disqualified. Ulti ultimately, Judge McAfee said that they, didn't, they couldn't prove an actual conflict of interest. And if you guys have been following this, an actual conflict of interest is interesting because in Georgia, it had never been proven before or the matter had not been put in, for, in front of a judge before because they've never had issues with prosecutors. 
prosecuting crimes. There was no impropriety back then. This is the first time we're dealing with it in the state. But notice that they're starting with that. They're like, you know, the trial court found that there was no actual conflict of interest. There was a smell of it. There was a smell of a conflict of interest. It was smoky in here. But an actual Judge McAfee didn't take it all the way across the throat, the goal line. He threw the ball a little bit. He gave them something, but not all. The trial court also permitted the prosecution to proceed under the direction of the Fulton County DA's office upon the withdrawal of Nathan Wade. So Nathan Wade came off. Being no error by the trial court, the present application merely reflects the defendant's dissatisfaction with the trial court's proper application of well-established laws and facts. Because the applicants have wholly failed to carry their burden of persuasion, this court should decline a review. So what is team, Fanny's team saying? They're saying, hey, we already had the hearings. They had their opportunity to provide, to provide evidence. Even though they provided cell hawk evidence, even though Yurti, two chains, sat on the stand and told us that this relationship existed, even though we have text messages from Terrence and Ashley Merchant, we have all of that. We have all of those things. Fanny's team is saying, even though you have all of those things, even though these lawyers fought for weeks using all of those things as evidence to prove that you guys actually lied on the stand. I believe Judge McAfee even said that there were some lies on the stand. This appeal starts with saying they didn't prove it. They did not prove it. They have the burden of persuasion and they didn't prove it. So you, Court of Appeals, should not even look at their review. You shouldn't look at it. They didn't prove it. Interesting. So analysis and legal documents, this is, le this is usually why they tell you why they stand on their argument, right? Sometimes they're going to use case law. I'm going to skip over those to, or, you know, not bore you guys with legally, but let's look at what their core arguments are. Okay. Analysis. The court will grant leave to appeal in an order where three things happen. One, the issue to be decided appears to be dispositive of the case. Meaning the thing that they go to the court of appeals for is so powerful that it should it, it should dismiss the whole case, right? Two, the order appears erroneous and will probably cause a substantial error or, at trial or adversely affect the rights of the appeals parties until the entry of final judgment in which the appeal will be expedited. Okay, so two, let's break that down. It's a long ass sentence. We hate those. So, if the court order that the judge made was an error, and because of that error, it also will cause an error at trial and will impact the rights of any of the defendants until we get to a final judgment in which the appeal would be expedited. So because we're not even close to a trial, some people are talking about this. I think I saw like Phil Holloway, a few other people are saying we're nowhere near trial. Like good luck in 2026 or 2027 if we even get there. Trump, would, if he got elected, would be in his second term. Even if Biden gets elected, whoever gets elected, we will be talking about a 2020 case in 2026. Use of tax payer dollars in the garbage. Why? So this is interesting because we are not at trial yet. We have a case that's being litigated in pre-trial motions, pre-trial things, pre-trial steps. 
there's already a problem. But Trump was here in Georgia this week. I think he was at like Chick-fil-A yesterday. I think he's in Georgia. He might still be in Georgia right now. I saw him on a few media appearances yesterday. I know he's in Georgia this week. But um, he had made a comment about this case. He's just like, it should be tossed out. I don't even know why we're wasting people's time talking about it. I don't know why we're wasting taxpayer money on it. And it, it makes the state look bad. It makes the state look bad to spend time on it. To spend, you know, that, that money that comes out of your paycheck, federal income taxes, state income taxes. Listen, it's tax season. Where's Ron? It's tax season. All of those little things that come out of your paycheck. If you live in, in the state of Georgia, your money is coming out of your paycheck to focus on a RICO case like this for a president. Some people may not mind. You know, there's a lot of people in, in my chat and in Leeds chat that are team fanny. You know, that's all good. Some people don't mind. If you don't mind your money being spent in that way, that's okay. But others that do mind are kind of like, all right, 2026? So you're going to take money from my paycheck for the next three years for that? I mean, you're going to take money from my paycheck regardless. But it's interesting to see how your tax dollars are being spent. Think about that, right? So that's the second part. Case is not litigated yet. But if it were, it will impact them during trial. That's why they're putting forth this emergency appeal right now, this expedited appeal. The third thing, the establishment of precedent is desirable. So, you know, I started reading this document with saying that, guys, is it's never been litigated. A DA doing something in the state of Georgia um, that showed an appearance of impropriety has never been it's never been litigated in the state's history. So we have to look at it now. Fanny says a, a trial court's ruling on a motion to disqualify a prosecutor is reviewed for an abuse of discretion. So I'm pretty sure she's going to start with saying what an abuse of discretion is. It looks like they cite two cases here. We have Newman, we have Williams, and the quote from the case says, such an exercise of discretion is based on a trial court's findings of fact, which must sustain that there is any evidence to support them. A proper application of abuse of discretion recognizes the range of possible dis conclusions the trial judge may reach with standards of evidence. Okay. So viewed, the trial court properly exercised its discretion in refusing to disqualify the district attorney. So Fanny's team is saying, Judge McAfee did the right thing. Ha. They cite two cases here, two cases. They're like, hey, in 2021 and in 2014, these two cases tell us what an abuse of discretion is. What is an abuse of discretion, guys? It's when a judge, his job is kind of like a quarterback. You have two teams. You have one team, you have the Boston Celtics, and you have the Atlanta Hawks where the fans are not very nice. <laughs> they flip you the double bird if you're wearing the other team's jersey. If you have two teams and you, you know, they're fighting. They have a litigation. They're fighting over something. In basketball, obviously, it's sportsmanship. It's the game, for the love of the game. A trial court is like the referee, where he's looking at calls. He's looking at if there's a foul. Or he's, look, he's looking at if there is you know, a touching that wasn't the right way. If people are being a little bit aggressive, you're looking at if there's going to be, and what's in his other job is to tell you what the penalty is. Okay. Three point shot this side, right. Or the balls going that way, right. The judge's job is the referee An abuse of discretion means that they thought that judge McAfee picture him and just, let's just do this for a moment. Judge McAfee and I are the same age. Picture me or Judge McAfee in a referee outfit. Maybe Judge McAfee. Don't think about me in a referee outfit. Stop it. Uh -huh. Judge McAfee in a referee outfit. And whether it's football or basketball, imagine if we did that, like uh, football or basketball. If you had another set of referees above him, more senior, 
look at what he did to see if it was a good job, right? That's what the appeals court does. They have to see if Judge McAfee did a good job in making that decision. Fannie and team are saying that he did, that he followed the right case law. He used the standard of abuse of discretion. Abuse of discretion is when a judge goes off of case law or makes a rule or a calling like he's calling a foul when he has no basis for it. We all see that in basketball games. Coaches are like, what the F? That's like the lawyers. They're like, what the F? What are you doing? That's how it's explained. You know, so you have to look at it from that standpoint. Fanny's on one of the teams and she's like, listen, McAfee did exactly what he was supposed to do based off of the law and based off of case law. But remember, guys, there is no case law that's ever been litigated in the state of Georgia on this. That's why I went up for appeal. I'm going to take a quick super chat break real quick to make sure I've caught everybody. A few more came in and then we'll go back to this document. But I hope you guys are putting down what I'm saying. If you understand what I'm talking about, please put a basketball emoji in the chat because that will let me know I'm doing a good job. That will let me know. It totally will. Um, shout out to the incredible folk. <laughs> I love that. He's, uh, he sends a $9.99 and it says, when is lead and everyone, when is lead and everyone you make better going to guest your show so it's rightfully on blast? You know, uh, that's, thank you for asking that question. Lead posted something on his community tab yesterday. I don't know if you saw it, the incredible Falk. He's going to take some time off over these next few weeks. So I'm going to be holding it down on my side with, uh, you know, the legal updates normally. Um, like we would on his side. However, I'm trying to get Nate the lawyer soon. Dear Woke Christian has sent me an email. I'm a little bit backed up on my email. I'm trying to get a collab with him. This Sunday, Chandler Remington is going to be doing a case review with me on the Courtney Clenny case. And that's the OnlyFans girl. Um, she was a white woman that killed her black boyfriend. And there's a lot of problems with that case. So we have just this morning locked that down um, we're going to be doing that this Sunday. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I have to email Nate, but you guys got to understand, like, <laughs> there's a lot we're doing here. Um, so when I do have the downtime, I will get with Nate and see if I can get him on this side. I did just do a collab with Nick Riccata. He was here, I think two weeks ago at this point. Lead and I usually do recaps on my side once a year, unless it's something like big and crazy. Like, do you guys remember Daryl Brooks? We cover that here on my side. But usually we'll do like the best of TLA and AV7 here annually. So that's always a really good time. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm networking in law too. I'm trying to get everybody over. It's going to be great. But I think an episode with Nate, the lawyer, would be fantastic. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, thank you so much. The incredible folk. I like that. Shout out to Papa Doc, who became a member. Thank you, Papa Doc. Welcome to the community. So happy to have you here. Till again, who says I earned my MBA at Harvard? Wow. Firstly, Till, great job. Congratulations. Till has entered the chat. He said, hold on. I have a business degree from Harvard. Okay, not just like Suffolk or any of these random school. I, I went to Harvard. Thank you, Till. He says, I also hated those ice cold Boston streets. They are so cold, guys. I did not know what Canada goose was and you know, until the winters in Boston, like you just started randomly seeing everybody with a little badge on, you know, their arms. And, you know, I was talking to my sister the other day, she's still in Boston. I'm in Atlanta right now. Last week it was snowing in Boston. It was snowing in Boston in April. It was like 80 degrees in Atlanta. I'm like, why do I want to go back? <laughs> he says, I moved to LA ASAP after school. So why ATL? How is the legal community processing this madness? So it looks like you have two questions. I'll try to answer both. Um, I came to ATL uh, about a year ago for a bunch of different reasons, content creation opportunities. I did have a job opportunity as well. I had some friends here, uh, really good reasons to come down. It just didn't pan out. Um, so I have made the decision to go back home temporarily. I'm going to take the bar exam up in Massachusetts. And then I hate the cold. So I'm probably going to move when, when it's done. 
I'm going up there literally to get the, the license because it's UBE, meaning it's a universal bar exam, which means that once you get it, you, you are licensed in many, many states and many, many jurisdictions. So that's why I chose to go back up there. Georgia, I haven't been a resident in Georgia. I didn't go to a Georgia law school. So it doesn't make sense for me to take the Georgia bar exam, right? Um, so I'm I'm going back to the state where I went to law school. So that's why, um, why ATL and why I'm going back. He says, how is the legal community processing this madness? I, you see Viva, you see all these people, you saw me, you saw Lee, like processing the whole Fanny thing. It's like, why? You know, personally, I looked at it as a young woman of color. I was really disappointed in her behavior on the stand. You know, because a prosecutor is a very prestigious job. Um, you know, if we're looking at metrics and demographics and numbers across the country, there's not a lot of people of color that are attorneys, whether you're Asian, whether you're Middle Eastern, whether, you know, you're East Asian, like Indian, um, you know, like the American Bar Associ Association is fairly new, relatively new in the nation. You know, and, and it really was a, a good old boys club for a really long time. Like you, you see Ruth Bader Ginsburg and so many of these justices, women did not start to go to law school until the 1950s, right? Which was still, you know, that's just gender. But when you bring other races into law schools, we also have 50 states that have different ways of admission. So it's still kind of new. Um, so for me, seeing a person that got themselves into a high position and then to act that way was a little disappointing. So, you know, sometimes people are like, oh my God, you just hate Fanny. I'm like, no, I'm just a little disappointed, man. So Till, I hope that answers your question. Shout out to James Burrow, who became a YouTube member. Welcome, James. I know you will like it here. Shout out to Trevlin Gale. I like that name, Trevlin. He says, you're doing great, honest and impartial, exposing the odor of mandacity of these law abuser criminals, AV. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Trevelyn. And Trevelyn, it looks like you are in the UK. So I appreciate uh, you being here. I really appreciate that. Shout out to No No. No No, you're on my side. Virtual hug. Welcome. Welcome, No No. No No says, no to the no. I'm here. Keep up the great work. No No, thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, there are a lot of strong brothers that support TLA. You know, last week I had a moment where, like I said, I think I mentioned it to you guys, put a video out, worked so hard on it and like no, no one watched. And it's not because you guys are not subscribed or notified. It's, it's the YouTube algorithm. It did not let you guys know that the live was happening. Like, I can't tell you how many comments people are like, oh my God, I didn't know you were live. Or you know what happens if you like looked at my channel right now and just looked at your notifications automatically, it will change to personalized. So if I'm not talking about Didi or Tasha K, and if that's what you like, if I'm not talking about that, <laughs> you might not get notified. But if I talk about the political stuff and you're not a viewer that's used to that, they'll personalize it for you. So they won't show it to you. The algorithm is not nice. Uh. But, you know, like there was a few strong brothers, No No being one of them. Viva almost made me cry on the stream. High value, man. Y you guys just like showed me so much love. And, and that's the men, the women, same thing. Like so many of you guys were like, keep going, sis. And with that being said, the stream sponsor is Kita T, a lawyer, a Boston sister. <laughs> the stream sponsor has been through the same process that I've been through, has worked really hard in her life to get there and is rooting me on to do it. Akita has been one of those people that was like, Avi, if you don't get that bar exam done, <laughs> we've had conversations, we've had DMs, like we've talked about it. She's just like, hey, you know, like keep going. Like I know how hard it is. I've been there, you know, and it's great to see women and men support this mission, support this vision, you know, like it's, it's not easy. And I want to make people like Kita and Nono proud. Um, I just want to make sure I also spell the word sponsor 
right? Imagine I become your lawyer and I don't know how to spell the word sponsor. Uh, Kita, thank you so much. Um, it's been a long call. You've been around since I started going on TLA's platform two years ago. Can you believe it's been two years? And back then, I was probably in my last year of law school. Kita G's a stream sponsor. If you guys can do me a giant favor and type Kita G in the chat, that would mean the world to me. Kita, thank you so much. I announced at the beginning, I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish this thing and get it over the goal line. Thank you. Okay. Kita's the stream sponsor. Let's go back in to see what Fanny is saying here. So she's saying Judge McAfee, a cool 34, has not made a mistake. Right? Here's the basis of her argument. I want to drop down. The first one is that the, the trial court found that the applicants have failed to show a violation of their due process rights or any other form of actual prejudice in their case. So they're saying defendants Trump and all the other people have not showed that their due process was impacted or any other form of prejudice to their case was done. So Fanny's team is like, yeah, I didn't violate your due process rights. That church speech didn't impact you at all, defendants. It didn't impact you. And the court said, even though you showed that evidence, the court found that it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to prove that. Right? Super, super interesting. Let's go back in to see what their second argument is, because I don't want to go too, too into that. Their second argument is the district attorney's public comments were not forensic misconduct requiring disqualification. Now she's drilling into her church speech. Now I'm not calling it an excuse. I'm, I'm showing you what her argument is to say that the church speech was not forensic misconduct. Okay. That's her second argument. Uh Oh, this is a blank page. I was taking a second to load. That's her second argument. Ah, the second argument is long. Oh my God, the long stroke. The third argument is Fanny did not engage in forensic misconduct. Well, what's the difference in that? You're saying that they didn't improve forensic misconduct as a second one. So two is you didn't improve sec um, forensic misconduct. And three... She did not engage in forensic mis misconduct. So there's a, the proving part, which is two, and engaging is three, right? Four, the trial court found no conflict of interest necessitating disqualification. So that's her fourth argument. Five, no appearance of impropriety warrants disqualification of Fanny. So this is, they're standing on their square here. And then they conclude. I want to go to the conclusion first. And it says, applicants have failed to carry their burden as to request for the review. The state of Georgia submits to this court to deny their application. So, and she signed it um, by, you know, F. McDonald Wakeford, who is the senior ADA in her office. Now, what does this all mean? It means that there are five arguments that Fanny is using to make sure that this does not go to the appeals court and that they don't review it. Is it guaranteed that her arguments will prevail? No. This is just what she is saying. The court of appeals is going to review this. It does not mean that based off of her issue with it that they're not going to review it because here's the other thing the trump defendants want them to review this faster because if they review it and they're like actually mcafee you might have been wrong you're wrong and i think that or we think that she should be removed off of the case fanny is standing on her square and saying do not remove me from this case because they have not proven these things. 
Here are my five arguments. Two is long, but let's see what she says on the first one. And we can go from there. Uh, man, it's the first and the second ones that are the longest. Yeah. The first one. The trial court found that the applicants failed to show a violation of their due process rights or any form of actual prejudice to their case. The trial court found that the defendants have failed to demonstrate that the district attorney's conduct has impacted or influenced the case to the detriment and that there has not been a showing that the defendants' due process rights have been violated. Despite this, the applicants first insist that the trial court must have erred and that the error is a structural one infecting, affecting their rights to due process. As will be shown below, there's a factual basis for the trial court's well-explained rulings. <laughs> See, they're defending Judge McAfee here. They're like, no, Judge McAfee had well-explained rulings. Hmm, interesting. And the applicant's insistence that error occurred, that the error occurred, amounts to no more than a disagreement with the court's assessment of those facts. Dissatisfaction with actual findings is not the basis to grant of appeal or reversal of the court's order, and the application should be denied. So what's Team Fanny saying? They are like, hey, just because you did not like the outcome of this doesn't mean that the ruling was wrong. You ever been on a bad date? You ever been on like a really terrible date? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, maybe, you, you, you know, you talk to the person and in person, like, you know, they're just a little bit different. But in your mind, like you've already ruled the gavel. You're like, nope. You sit down, you talk to the person, they say something crazy. And in your mind, you're like, nope. Put a one in the chat if you've been on a bad date. This is kind of like that. Fanny's example is, okay, you went on a bad date. Just because it went bad doesn't mean that the decision was wrong, which is a fair point. But if you've been on a bad date, is that the example? Or do you take that example and take it to an appear, appeals court because you had a bad experience. That's kind of like if you go on a bad date and you go back to the app and you're like, Hinge, what the hell? Or, you know, what is the other one? Millionaire Max, what the hell? You know, like what? You're supposed to have elite people. Or if you're a guy and the woman's just, you know, are you going to pay for my car note next? <laughs> like. You have a bad experience or just because you're unhappy. Does that warrant you putting an appeal up? That's what Fanny's team is saying. She's just like, they just didn't like how this came out. And that's why they're putting the appeal in. And it's like, Fanny, is that why they're doing it? Cell Hawk, you know, Nathan having the garage door opener him getting divorced the day after he got hired, you guys lying on the stand, Terrence's text messages. You think these people are making all of this up? So if you're on a bad date and the, per I don't know, maybe the person's like batshit crazy. And if you have evidence, I don't know, maybe, maybe you recorded it. If you're in a state where recordings are allowed without consent, maybe you hear how crazy the other person sounds and you have evidence of that person being crazy because most of the time when we, when we make decisions that this other person that is across the dinner table is not worthy of our time, we typically know. And that is gathering evidence to help you come to that conclusion. Fanny is saying here, you people have gathered the evidence. But you just don't like the outcome. You just don't like it. <laughs> that's, that's argument number one. We have concluded argument number one. Let's go to two. The district attorney's public comments were not forensic misconduct requiring disqualification. Y'all ready for this? Now we go into church speech. 
Here's what they say. Citing public comments made by the DA, the applicants contend that the district attorney engaged in forensic misconduct. Given the trial court's findings, which are supported by the record, the trial court correctly ruled that Fannie did not engage in disqualification it did not engage in disqualifying forensic misconduct. There are two generally recognized grounds for disqualification of a prosecuting attorney. The first ground is based on a conflict of interest, and the second is described as forensic misconduct. This is the Williams case they keep citing. That case, dear viewer, is from 1988. They talked about it in court last week or the week before. Judge McAfee is using a 1998 case to make this decision. The, uh, like going back to the basketball analogy, the attorneys, each team has to take that Williams case and argue for their side or against their side. Fanny says that the Williams court identified an example of forensic misconduct as a following. So like the improper expression by the, the DA of his personal belief in the defendant's guilt. I have a problem with this one, especially the way that it's cited. So if the Williams case stands for a prosecutor's personal belief in a defendant's guilt, uh, might have to do it, Fanny. I'm sorry. Personal belief. And I'm thinking about Boots here. Because <sighs> the charge speech, did she not? put her personal beliefs in that? that that's, it, it has to be a personal belief. All right, guys, I'm not signed in. I have YouTube premium. Let me, let me take this off for a second. I'm gonna pull up the church speech because I think her personal beliefs were in there. This is just my, my opinion. Her personal beliefs were definitely in there because she talked about race. She talked about, you know, people coming after Nathan because of the color of his skin. Is that not a personal belief? I, I don't know. I mean, this is this is tough. What do y'all think? Can you put a one in the chat if you think that if Fanny had the church speech? And if she said that people were attacking Nathan because he was black, put a one in the chat if you think that is a personal belief that Fannie Willis had. Put a two in the chat if you don't think that it was a personal belief that Fannie Willis had. It's kind of tough. It's kind of tough because it depends on who the viewer and the audience is. My, law, um, my criminal law professor used to say that all the time. He would say that um, the words, it depends, are two sexy words. But you guys, it's, it looks like a lot of you guys agree with me that it's a personal belief. No? Let's go to the church. I just want to watch it. We're not going to watch the full thing again. I just want to watch a piece of it because I think it was riddled with personal beliefs. Riddled. You know, not just one or two, like, there was a lot of things we can glean from that. So for them to make that argument, it's interesting. But let's go back to shout out to Big Bethel. The plot that can Big Bethel has entered the chat. Let's listen. Okay, well, that's a small snippet of it. I was hoping to get a little piece. Let's go back because I know that there is a 30 minute one. Sorry, guys. All right, I'm going to stop because I, I don't want to derail the stream here. There's a 30 minute one. Let's see, Fanny Willis Church speech. Let's pull the 30 minute clip. 
but I won't show you the full 30 minutes. I just want to show you the fact that and we'll go to most replayed that it does have personal beliefs in it. That is my opinion. Let's go. Oh, God. Can you guys not hear the sound? Jesus. I'm sitting here responding to this. You know what happened? I, I X stream yard. So I had to log into everything all over again. Jesus Christ. Struggle streaming. I'm so sorry, guys. Would the lead make a mistake like this? All right. Present. Share screen. Also share audio tab. It's on. You guys are saying you can't hear anything. Fanny ain't saying nothing. I don't know. Fanny Willis, Big Bethel. Share to share audio. Share tab instead. Okay, I'm going to test it. Going to hit play. Put a one in the chat if you can hear this. One. One person says they can hear. Because she just said a lot there. You guys can't hear it. I don't know. God damn it, stream me hard. Okay, not going to do it. Not going to put you guys through that. I am so sorry and incredibly embarrassed. Thank you, StreamYard, for the embarrassing moment. Um, people, A ton of people left. Wow. Okay, back to the document because also share tab audio. To share audio, share tab instead. Select tab to share. Oh, I hate StreamYard. Okay, I hate it so much right now. Let's finish this up. And then since I'm embarrassed, I'm going to go. So <laughs> sharing the screen back to window. Clicking off a of big Bethel. Coming back to the document that does not have sounds. <laughs> this will be good. Okay. Personal belief. Check out the church speech. I will include it in a card so you can see it. There is absolutely like she definitely had a personal belief in the defendant's guilt because if she wasn't talking about Michael Roman and the other defendants, she used the terms saying that they have something against, um, they have something against the people that were selected. They had something against Nathan Wade. When you say they, who were you talking about? And that includes personal beliefs, but that they qualifier is looking at the defendants, the pool of defendants. When she talks about stealing an election, that's what we're talking about, All right? Anywho, the Supreme Court cautioned that the prosecuting attorneys must be of such egregious nature as to require the disqualification. Another consideration is whether such remarks were part of a calculated plan evidencing a design to prejudice the defendant in the minds of the jurors, or whether such remarks were inadvertent, abate, improper, or utterances. I want to focus on this one real quick where it says that it was evincing a design to prejudice the defendant in the minds of the jurors. When you are speaking to a church locally where you could have a jury of potential jurors that might be sitting in that church, if hundreds of people in Atlanta are watching the news and they see a recap of that clip that I just tried to show to you guys that did not have sound, that was fun. Um, you are looking at something that could taint the minds of the jurors. If people are left leaning in this area and you know they respect what Fanny is saying on 
um, not the stand, but in a pulpit months later, if they're selected for the jury, are we literally going to say that those people are not tainted on the jury pool? It's interesting, right? It's interesting, but it absolutely could prejudice the minds of the jurors in the future. Judge McAfee did talk about this. He mentioned, okay, listen, it, it could prejudice the mind of the jurors, but we're so far from trial right now. We're not even close to trial right now that even though it was played in media, even though that's happening, it is likely ugh, that um, it's, it's just too far away to tell. So he did, he rejected that argument. Fanny and team are bringing it up again, right? Whether such remarks were inadvertent, improper or utterances. In essence, a comment may be improper without being disqualifying. So they're admitting that her, her church speech was improper, but it doesn't mean that she should be disqualified. <laughs> Is that making an excuse for people? I don't know. I think that's kind of making an excuse. This court has recognized that the touchstone of due process analysis in cases of alleged prosecutorial misconduct is the fairness of trial, but not the culpability of the prosecutor. So again, we go to Williams, we go to Whitworth, all of those things. Mindful of these guideposts, the trial court made extensive factual findings at the DA's public comments and then determined that one, the comments were not sufficiently egregious to require disqualifications under Williams, right? Two, the comments did not deny the defendants an opportunity for a fundamentally fair trial, right? So those are their two arguments. They break it down. As a factual matter, the trial court found that the DA's public comments concerned either the office's conviction rates. Oh, man, I did not read this earlier. Y'all are not going to believe this. Okay. So now... They are trying to tell us what the content of her church speech comments were and what McAfee said that they were. Because it says, first, the trial court found that Fanny's comments either concerned the office's conviction rates, the charges in the indictment, the procedural posture of the case, the need for or importance of the investigation, or personal anecdotes. How many is that? One, two, three, four, and five. They said that Fanny's speech, God damn StreamYard, Fanny's speech had these five things. I'm telling you, I just want to play it. Fanny, is it, you guys can see me doing that. I just want to play it. Okay, let's stop sharing this for a minute. Because I, we now we need to go to the speech. I, the speech had more than those five categories. It totally did. Okay, do I need to do it here? Let's try it from this window since the stream yard is being picky. Fanny Willis Church Speech. I'm gonna try it one more time, guys. It's just, it's so relevant to this conversation. Okay, I think I have it. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Okay, I think I have it now. I think I have it. Okay. One in the chat, if you can hear this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Not sure. Yes. Thank you, Tay. All right. Okay. I'm so happy you guys can hear this. This made my day. All right. We're going to listen to this with a good ear. Okay. I want you to see if you can hear personal beliefs in what she's about to say. I'm going to bring us to the middle. This is what I was playing before. I want you to listen to see if you believe that if anything she's saying has a personal belief. This is particularly when she's talking about the case. That is what that document just showed 
that they were arguing about. All right, let's play it. God always brings you to that safe place where you need to be. And so the invitation to come. I'm going to skip God's ahead, guys. Kindness, and the only thing he wanted to do was make the world a more equitable place. He said, Dr. King was not a perfect man. He spoken to her and told her to seek me out. And so she did. She said, you had seen my heart. And you father knew my motive, my talent, my ability, and my character would be constantly attacked. You did not tell me that the people would think they required of me perfection and flawless. God, why would you send this imperfect and very flawed woman to that position? God, you did not tell me my home would be swept multiple times for bombs Oof. or that most days and nights that I would spend them in isolation because that was the safest place to be. You forgot to mention, Lord, that I would have to abandon my home. You forgot to mention the loneliness of this position and you certainly didn't tell me about this stress. Flips the page. God, I trust you. God, I thank you. God, I love you. I thank you for every tap that makes me stronger. See, I sit here with a peace that surpasses. <laughs> Dear God, I do not want to be like those that attack me. I never want to be a Marjorie Taylor Greene mm. who has never met me, but has allowed her spirit to be filled with me. How does this woman who has the honor of being a leader in my state. How is it that she has not reached out to me? She can tell me, I don't agree with anything you're doing, but I do not agree with people threatening your life or the life of your family. That is conduct that is wrong and intolerable, and as a leader, I shall not stand for it. How did such a woman come to think that it was normal and normalized? that another woman was worthy of such cruelty. I would never wish for her to have the experiences of the threats that I received, the derogatory name calling, the being docked multiple times. God, you never told me that on Christmas night, 2023, that I would get an emergency call from Caper Green, my chief of investigations. The police are surrounding your house. A man has called 911 and he said he shot a woman in the head. Oh my God. I am headed there. You never told me the pure, unimaginable fear as I believe my oldest child was dead in my home. Oof. I cannot describe, God, for you the panic and the terror and the fear I had believing my child was no longer with me. I thank you, Lord, that it all turned out to be a cruel halt and just another day to steal my joy as I tried to celebrate you. God responds to his hard-headed trial. Pray for Marjorie Taylor Greene. Wow. Pray for the man's soul who called your house. God, wait a minute. I ain't there yet. I'm still in my walk with you. Okay. All right, Penny. Flawed, hard-headed, imperfect me. Pray for her? Yes. But dear God, are you listening? Why does Commissioner Thorne and so many others question my decision in a special counsel? Lord, your flawed... I'm going to stop it here, guys, because as you can see, you know, I wanted to show you that this entire speech 
had personal beliefs in it. Notice something very important that you see her reading from. It is a binder with, you know, what you're going to read in a speech. Okay. Most people do that. They prepare things. Even for this stream, guys, I have notes. I have an outline. I know what I'm going to talk about. I think about it. But unlike Fanny, I like to do it off the top of my head. Fanny here is reading something word for word. Fanny here is now where we're watching this, now on the third person that she's talking about. She's now talking about a commissioner. She talked about Marjorie Taylor Greene. She talked about, you know, an unfortunate event where somebody was surrounding her home. She prepared this. That's what the lawyers are saying. We are looking at 30 minutes of her being in this pulpit. And in the middle of that 30 minutes, she is going through a list of three or four threats or people that have attacked her. And she's involved religion in this. So if the sound played earlier, it would have been a nice segue to back to this document on page six, where her team is arguing that there were no personal beliefs and that the basis for prosecutorial misconduct is that there needs to be personal beliefs. They say it right here. The comments were not like specifically egregious enough. Let me make myself small. Not sufficiently egregious enough and did not affect the impending trial with the sort of inevitable unfairness to be considered forensic misconduct under Williams. I think what we just saw is she did have her personal beliefs. And that's what McAfee said is that he didn't think that it was there, but we can just see from the small snippet that I showed you guys, there's some personal beliefs there, right? You're, you're going to taint a jury with that. And I think that's what this is, you know? Um, yeah, they talk about it here. Like the jury pool is not actualized yet. The jury's not together yet. As a factual matter, the court found that her public comments concerned the conviction rates, the charges in the indictment, the pro procedural posture of the case, the need of importance for investigation and personal anecdotes. Insofar as the district attorney delivered the speech at a local church, the trial court concluded the speech did not cross the line because it failed to name the defendant. It did not disclose any sensitive or confidential information. It did not address the merits of the indicted offenses to move the trial court of public opinion. Further, the case is too far removed from majority selection to actual prejudice or proper effect for the jury pool to actualize. These findings are all amply supported by the record and not clearly an error. The applicants do not challenge the trial court's factual findings, and they are sustained for purposes of appeal. So as you can see, like their team is fighting this tooth and nail. They're like, she didn't do anything wrong. These are the categories that you should be looking for. She didn't talk about anything that was particularly personal. And I mean, I disagree, guys. I think that she did. I think that she did. I'm going to take a quick super chat break, guys. Um, and then there are some cash apps too. And then we'll keep, we'll, we'll start to wrap this up. Shout out to, there's a few people on here. Shout out to Alton Spooner, who sends $10 and says, great show. Thank you so much, Alton. Really appreciate that. Shout out to No No. No No sent me 20 on the cash app and says, for my donation. Thank you so much, No No. Awesome. I think that's all that does it on my side. Coming over here to the super chats. Thanks. You, thank you again to the stream sponsor, Kita G. Want to shout out a Madden Mine who sends $5 and says, Hey, AV, 
one of your rare early shows. The market is closed and I'm here. It's hard to catch late shows, but I still love the show. I'm mad in mind. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm glad you caught me today on an early one. Trevelyn's back and says, Big Fanny played Satan. KJV Book of Job ch chapter one, version six on Sunday, the 14th January speech after her conduct was first exposed on the 12th. I mean, that's the thing, Trevor, and that's a good point because if the conduct was exposed on the 12th, that means that she took a few days, two days to put together a speech, which as a lawyer, you're going to want to be careful with what you say. As a prosecutor, even more careful with what you say. And remember, Michael Roman's motion, this motion that everybody's arguing about was filed on January 8th. Shout out to 10 plus sounds that says no sound. Thank you guys so much for bringing that to my attention. Shout out to Tay Biz says for the determination for the audio, leave no good text behind. That's right. I, I needed to figure it out. It was going to bother me. It was going to bother me. Shout out to Drew Beats again, who says you're doing fine. Promise. Thank you, Drew. That, that meant a lot. And then lastly, shout out to Karen for becoming a new member. And then Karen, I think this is you on Cash App. She says, thank you for all you do. Thank you guys so much for watching. And again, I'm trying to stretch myself to like learn how to do this. Like, believe me, it's never easy. <laughs> no live stream is perfect. There's always some shenanigans, um, but glad that that worked out. Thank you guys for all the supers and supporting the channel. Welcome to all the new members. Um, okay, let's go back to this. Nice little brief super chat break of the year. What do they also say here? They also say that um, the trial court properly applied its findings and reasoning to the comments and they were not egregious and did not infect the impending trial with the sort of inevitable fairness to be forensic misconduct. So they are basically standing on their square. They're like, you know, nothing like a pre-calculated pre-trial plan designed to prejudice the defendants or secure convictions came out. Um, the defendants did not identify any one statement where she injected her personal belief as to the defendant's guilt or appealing to the public weighing of evidence. See, I think that's a weak argument. The whole thing had her personal beliefs in it. The whole thing. For us to say that not you know, because they wanted they wanted to pull a specific one. That's what they're saying here. Give me an example. Give me a sentence. Give me and you know, an, like put something in this appeal that addresses exactly what she said. They're trying to harp on the fact that she didn't def she didn't name any names. But how can you use that when she's naming Marjorie Taylor Green? So it also shows even the speech writing. You were careful not to you were careful not to name a defendant's name. But we can name Marjorie Taylor Green. We can do that. Ooh, I think that just might be the the gold of the stream. They want a specific example of Fanny doing it. The defendants have not identified any public statement injecting Fanny's personal belief as to the defendant's guilt or appealing to the public weighing of evidence. Yes, she did. She did. I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you guys. I, I mean, you can disagree with me if you want. They say there has been no showing of an effort by Fanny to wield any improper influence over a trier of fact which of course has not been selected. So they're like, she did not say anything in that speech that would have any improper influence over a jury. I, I, I mean, I think that is a very weak argument. They cite a case here. They cite another one, a 1980s case. They, they definitely hit the jury with this. She hit the jury with this. And they're just, you know, I, I'm not even going to go through the rest of this document, guys, because I'm starting to get tired. But like they're talking about a jury pool that has not been put together yet. They're siding with everything that McAfee said. There's no information that's off. There's, you know, there's no forensic misconduct. You know, they go into it a little bit deeper with argument three that there's no forensic misconduct. 
they go into it that there's no conflict of interest. Let's see what they say in this one. The operative question is whether the DA has a disqualifying personal interest in the criminal prosecution of the defendants. Does she? After hearing testimony, the trial court engaged in a fact-intensive analysis, examining all of the surrounding circumstances. In doing so, the trial court detailed Fannie and, and Nathan's expenditures, examined the process by which Fannie eventually hired Wade, noted the terms of his contract, considered Fannie's yearly salary, and assessed any supposed financial gain flowing to, to Fannie. I mean, she did have financial gain. Like, you know, you guys went on trips together. That's a financial gain. Ultimately, the court determined that Fannie was not greatly or and pecuniarily interested in the prosecution, meaning she was not making money. That's what McAfee said, number one. Number two, Fannie was not financially motivated to indict or prosecute the case. Again, what McAfee said. And three, the record affirmatively disproved the allegation that Fanny sought to prolong the case, given the demonstrable attempts to prevent delays in the prosecution. These sound findings that Fanny lacked any personal case in the prosecution are substantiated by the record, and they negate the existence of an actual conflict of interest. So they're, they're siding with McAfee here in all of their arguments, all five. Now they talk about the appearance of impropriety, right? Um, the trial court correctly determined that no appearance of impropriety warranted her dis disqualification. I don't think that's what Judge McAfee said. That doesn't feel right. While also remedying any remote likelihood that the actual trial would be affected. As um, McAfee recognized, the issue of qual qualification lies on a continuum. Somewhere in the middle of the continuum is the appearance of impropriety based on the conduct on part of the attorney. Okay, lots of quotes here. They're taking that from a case. I'm not going to read that to you guys. The McAfee determined that the defendants had failed to show a violation of their due process rights or any prejudice to their case in, in any way. It follows that the actual trial would not be tainted by an appearance of impropriety, and therefore the trial court correctly declined to disqualify her. But the trial court went a step further, finding that it could not determine based on the evidence when the relationship between Fanny and Nathan involved into a romantic one. Assuming that Nathan continued involvement in the prosecution would have produced an appearance of impropriety, the court allowed for his withdrawal. Wow. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just... Setting aside whether Nathan's removal from the case was in fact necessary, he withdrew uh, representation hours before the court issued its order. And Fanny accepted the resignation. Accordingly, the court properly exercised its discretion in denying the motion to disqualify. There's no basis to grant the review on this ground. I disagree, guys. I disagree with their arguments in many ways. Um, wholeheartedly, I think that that church speech had a lot there. They say that everything that McAfee did was right and there's no grounds for appeal. But what I did not see was the quote when McAfee said that she was making decisions that were not sound or professional. Notice that that was not included in their appeal. It wasn't included at all. I thought that was super interesting. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start to wrap up. This is a record. I haven't gone for two hours in a really long time. I want to thank everyone that had an opportunity to tune in today. Tomorrow, we will be back on the Diddy case. I already read that one. Oh, my gosh. We have more pictures. We have more shenanigans. This is Christian um, Diddy's son. So we are going to be reviewing that document. Saturday, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Trump hush money case because it's starting on Monday. It should be starting and Trump has had a lot going on this week. He's personally suing the judge. There's like two or three other things that came out, um, but we're definitely going to be doing that. And then Sunday, I have my collaboration here on my channel with um, 
with, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting her name right now, Chandler Remington. Um, she has a legal channel and I believe she's taking the LSAT tomorrow. So we will be tackling the Courtney Clenny case on Monday. Thank you guys so much for watching. I want to shout out all the huge donors of tonight's stream. We had Akita G, who is the stream sponsor. No, no, bless me on the Cash App. No, no, was here. It was good to see you over here on my side. Thank you guys for dealing with my audio issue and listening to everything. Shout out to Darren. Shout out to Kathy. Shout out to Not Sure. Um, and yeah, your girl is getting tired when you talk for two hours just straight. There's a lot. Again, remember, you can get the That Was Cute candle from Chalkboard Candles. I have it lit here. It smells amazing. In time for Mother's Day, there's an AV7 code that you can use. Information is in the district in the description box, and we can go from there. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your Thursday. We will be back. Until then, I will see you in the next one. Stay safe out there. Bye.